Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems. Very biased question as usual. Um, today I would like to talk about a slightly more difficult topic. Uh, actually pretty cute, but slightly more difficult and also quite new. So it's roughly from the 1990s, uh, which is like really, really new in the sense of mathematics where everything is like a thousand years old or something. Um, and it was really one of the key observations in this whole business of and quantum groups, uh, so Drinford and Co, uh, quantum groups in the 80s, uh, they have school and whatever. So a lot of uh, quantization things happening in the 80s, uh, which gave us, for example, new knot polynomials and whatnot, but it also gave us something new about some old topic. So usually quantization is kind of an enrichment of an, of an old, of a structure you know very well. And most of the time it actually doesn't tell you something new about your old structure but it rather is something new to explore. And this is one example where it actually gave new information about something really, really classical, something, well, classical not in the sense of the old Greeks, but certainly something like a hundred years old and like used everywhere. And you will see in the, the very last slide that whatever I'm going to do is like a low temperature behavior. And it really only makes sense if we have a quantum around, whatever that means. We go there uh, as we go along, we go there later. So for now, um, all I want to do is the following. So there's a notion of a Lie algebra, and Lie algebra has played a, like a, a super key important role in mathematics in uh, general, and so do their representations. So they act on vector spaces and play a really, really important role. Uh, the way I usually like to think about it is, well, there are two natural notions that you meet very early in your mass life, maybe not very early in your mass, that you will eventually meet in your mass life, and that's the one of a manifold and the one of a group. If you combine both, then you get something like this round object, it's a manifold, and it's a group, so you can uh, multiply vectors on that thing, and it's kind of a smooth structure at the same time, and what you get is called a Lie group. So Lie group is like a continuous symmetry, if you want. And the Lie algebra is like it's like it's a smooth space. Lie group is a smooth space, and the tangent is a linear space. Um, and that one is the Lie algebra. And it turns out that the Lie algebra has captured a lot about the smooth group. And the smooth group, well, is related to many, many, many different things in mathematics. It turns out that the Lie algebra is like a first order approximation, if you want, of the Lie group, and it's like really useful. And the representations, like acting on vector spaces. Uh, that's just a representation. The symmetries on vector spaces, if you want, they play like a, a really, really, really important role in like everywhere, not just in mathematics, but also in physics or in uh, chemistry, maybe not so much in chemistry. Chemistry much, likes much more uh, discrete groups, this is more the continuous version of the one. But clearly in mass and in physics, they kind of play it kind of everywhere. They're like continuous symmetries. And so it was kind of a crucial task to have a good understanding of those representations because they kind of really turn up everywhere. So that's what we want to do. We want to understand those representations. Task, find good models of these representations. Excellent. So let's try to do it. Um, and what you can do is the following. So there's a kind of well-known way to present at least the nice Lie algebra. I'm not going to do anything crazy about crazy Lie algebras. Let's just think about matrices. Let's just think about SL3. Uh, the Lie algebra SL3 is just complex three by three matrices with trace zero. And you can uh, present it by generators and relations. And the generators are exactly what you would write down. And I don't write down the relations. But anyway, the generators are usually got EF and H. So H is the diagonal and really it's just you need trace zero, so you put one and minus one somewhere along the diagonal. So you have H1, H2. For higher matrices, you would have H3, H4, whatever. And F and E are kind of the, the duals to one another, where you to put just one off diagonal entry into your matrix. And these are called the Chevalier generators of the Lie algebra. And as I said, they generate the Lie algebra, taking uh, the Lie bracket, whatever, and they satisfy some relations. So if you write down a representation, it's kind of enough to specify what you do on those guys. And an efficient way to do this is to use graphs. Yeah, so in, in this video, a representation is nothing else than a graph. And it roughly works as follows. So say you have a vector space, here's my, my baby example, just three vectors, the three standard vectors, E1, E2, and E3, and you just write them down as vertices. 
e1, e2, e3. So maybe let me do this in color. e1, e2, e2 is this one here, e1 is this one here, and maybe red, e2, e3 is this one. And you just write down edges for the labels, uh, for the action of the, the generators. So for example, uh, and whenever an x it, it kills it, whenever an x is zero, you don't write down anything. You only write down the non-zero one. So this edge, for example, E1, as you can just see from the matrix, if you multiply the standard vector to it, the standard vector would be this one. You just do that. E1 times the standard vector is E2. So you just draw an edge from one to two, label it E1, and give it the corresponding scalar. And that's how you get a, a graph. So you do the same for E2. E2, for example, takes a second one and sends it to the third one, and you get this one. Here above, I kind of skip the ages. The ages would do something like this. Uh, doesn't really matter. Um, so I just skip them. I just put in E and F, but in general, you would put down all of them. Okay. Turns out that these graphs get a bit messy, mostly because for more fancy representations, actually you would have multiple arrows going out, all for labeled E1 with some various scalars, whatever, five. And here's maybe E1 with seven or whatever, something like that. So they get pretty messy. They're kind of a nice way to encode the nice and small representations, but for general representations, like really a messy story. Um, and that's what people could do for a long, long time. Uh, not, not, not super helpful. It's kind of nice to think about representation as graphs, but maybe not so super helpful. And then in the 1990s, people found this combinatorial model, the crystal underlying the representation, which is now really a graph. It gets rid of all difficulties. And it's really just a labeled graph. In particular, it gets rid of this shit here, which is kind of really important. So in the original graph, you would have uh, multiple edges labeled E1 going out crazy in every direction with some crazy scalars. And you don't need that anymore. You now you just have edges labeled E or F in this case. So usually people go for F. So um, I have two Fs here, F1 and F2 is still the same example. And instead of writing F1, I just write one. And instead of F2, I just write two. So this is an edge for F2. And as you can see, there's just one edge. So this is a representation, it's just a city graph, it's just a graph, maybe not a city graph. This is just a representation. Uh, ignore the labels of the uh, vertices if you want to generate them. Those guys it's just, it's just generated them using Sage. So Sage can do that. There's code in the description that you can just run yourself online and you can generate those graphs. Anyway, it has some vertices, forget the labels, as I said, and it has just one edge F from each vertex and not anything more. And you don't even need the scalars anymore. So there are no scalars. So the only thing you see here, it looks like scalars. Then again, this is just the label of the corresponding edge. You could just do give it a color if you want. And it's just much easier. So instead of having um, something like this, Fi acts on uh, Vj and you get a lot of crap, you just draw one edge from Vj to the leading term of that expression. So you kind of ignore everything else. It's like taking a matrix and ignoring the upper diagonal part. So it's like uh, just looking at the leading term. Of, a, of, of the action. You only write down the leading terms. And it turns out that the leading terms always have scalar one. So you kind of ignore the scalar one. And the only crucial thing here is that I haven't told you how to find the leading term. And that's why this was hidden for such a long time, hidden in plain sight, if you want. Because if you don't have quantum, it's not so easy to tell what the leading term is supposed to be. Anyway, so the quantum will help us to find the leading term. But in general, there is an action on the representation such that you have a leading term and friends, and you just don't draw the friends anymore because it gets too complicated. And you only keep the kind of the combinatorial skeleton of the representation and you call it a crystal uh, for a name that I'm going to explain in a second. But it's really just, here is our crystal, for example, uh, for this one, it's the same, same type of information because now everything's also dual. You only need the action of F, the action of H is also clear, so you only need a little bit of information and the graphs get really, really simple in some sense. And you can study the combinatorial properties of the representation instead of kind of messing around uh, and it gets really complicated with a lot of arrows and labels and whatever going out. And this was really a crucial, kind of a really crucial development in the 1990s. So what you can show is the following. Every representation has a crystal, fantastic. And it uniquely determines uh, the representation 
And you can even have some, some rules like, oh, you can decompose tensor products according to uh, the representation. So it's really, really good. It's a combinatorial model of a representation that um, kind of determines the representation and kind of only keeps track of the leading terms. It's like taking a matrix, like a complicated matrix, let's say upper triangular, and you only look at the diagonal and this determines the matrix. So something, something along the line of, of, of this kind of description. Um, and it's, it's really, really amazing. So um, really, really a simple model. You just have now an easy graph associated to uh, any representation of anything, essentially, or at least for, for the easier Lie algebras like SL or SP or SO, uh, those guys. It's, it's really amazing. And people really miss that for 80 years of representation theory. They missed that. And then it was found in the 1990s uh, using quantization. And the idea is the following. So the big question is how to find this leading term, right? People miss this leading term. What, what does it even mean to be a leading term? And trick is what people realize and to get this precise is like terribly difficult. So let's not go into that, but let me just explain what's happening. So the trick is there's actually a quantum object, a quantum envelope in algebra, if you want, and a certain basis, a canonical basis, such that this action has coefficients in like, like polynomials in Q with a leading term one. The polynomials in Q, so there's a leading term one, and then there are a lot of polynomials in Q, um, and they kind of happen everywhere uh, around your representation, and your F generator will now send the VJ to something, to some crazy linear combination. There will be a VK, where you have a one plus God knows, and there will be whatever, a VK prime, where you have a Q plus God knows, or something like that, uh, something like that. So you have now all these Qs floating around, the quantum is just, you have now an extra variable here. And the point is, the kind of, you can kind of scale everything so that everything happens within a polynomial ring. And then you can specialize Q to zero and all the funny terms die. They just go away because if Q is zero, and the funny guys go away and only the leading terms survive. So this is kind of the idea. There are polynomials in this variable and specializing the polynomial, evaluating it at Q to zero gives you um, kind of this crystal structure. And people think of it as like the, the, the temperature zero limit. Yeah. So you might have something really messy if something is, is kind of, this is like the representation in general, but at low temperature, at temperature zero, it looks like a crystal. It looks, gets kind of really nice and easy to describe structure. And we're kind of doing the same thing. In order to find this leading term, you specialize polynomials in Q to zero, so that's evaluating them at zero. So you pick out the leading term in those polynomials and by magic it happens that you get kind of this leading term in the representation as well. And in that sense, crystals are like the low temperature limit of representations. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.